Hi everyone, this is Al McKay. Welcome to episode 147. I'm speaking with Bobby Chu. This is the second interview we've done together. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. All right, so welcome to a brand new episode. Um, this is part two of an episode I did with Bobby Chu a while back. And this one I wanted to do as a separate episode because we get very specific into how Bobby got started and a lot of his history, but more importantly, how he launched Schoolism and just a lot of really amazing insights that he's been able to share uh, along the way as a successful artist. So I think this will be a lot of fun to get into. Now, before we get started, I just want to quickly mention, if you haven't checked out the new website, you can go to alanmckay.com. And that website has been a long time in the making, but it's something that I wanted to build a giant resource for everything pertaining to the podcast, to YouTube and everything else. And I will just quickly say that for the longest time, I hated and loathed my website. It was also very slow to load and uh, a lot of different reasons behind it. So for the longest time, I basically avoided putting content out on my site. And it's always been that if you want any content from me, then you jump on my inner circle VIP mailing list, which is free. And I put out endless amounts of, of uh, content there, but I've never really had a home to put everything else. And it's really counterintuitive, but it's something that I've kind of wrestled with. And looking back in hindsight, you know, why didn't I just blast my entire site, start from scratch, have something at least that um, that worked if that was the issue. But either way, uh, I've been working hard for quite a while on a new site. And last week, I finally launched it. And I'm really happy about that uh, because it has a lot of resources out there about how to get started, how to really level up your career. And in addition to this, I wanted it to be clear that this isn't just for visual effects. I have a massive area which is uh, for video and you'll be able to actually filter through it. So if you wanted to go on there specifically for 3ds Max or Fume Effects tutorials, you can literally just click the buttons for those and it'll filter those out. Or if you wanted something like Houdini, then you can go in there and do the same thing. Or if you wanted specifically talks and, and other things like that that are not 3D specific, you can go in and you can just click the buttons to filter out what you want or what you don't want. So I wanted to make it easy to categorize a lot of content because I want to start putting up loads and loads of content moving forward. But on top of that, I have plenty of guides and other really great stuff. So I wanted this to be a place that if you're just starting out or depending on what you want, you can go there and there'll be a specific area that is tailored exactly to what you need. So you can have your own path. And I thought this would be a lot of fun. And this is just the beginning, but I'm really proud of finally launching this and now having a place that I can contribute to. So again, if you want to go there, alanmckay.com. And at the same time, if you want to get in my inner circle, it's just alanmckay.com slash inside to sign up to the inner circle email list there as well. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm really anxious to get into this episode, but I'd love some feedback from you as to what you might want to uh, see on the website, other content and ideas like that. Uh, I want to be very active in contributing to this website. So um, yeah, shoot me an email at any time. You can just go to my website and find all the contact information there. Uh, and that is it. So let's dive into this episode. Okay, just quickly, one of the biggest problems that we face as artists is figuring out how much we're worth. Typically, the situation is that we go into job interviews and we're asked how much we're going to charge. We either shoot ourselves in the foot by saying that we charge less than we're worth, so that way we get the gig, and indirectly end up leaving tens of thousands of dollars accumulatively over time on the table 
rather than actually asking what we should be charging. At the same time, you don't want to alienate your employers by asking for too much and leaving yourself out in the cold. So what I've done is I put together a website, check it out, www.vfxrates.com. And this is a chance for you to be able to put in your experience, your discipline, the location you're working, all the good things that will give you a fairly accurate idea of what you and everyone else should be charging in your discipline. This is something that I'm going to continue to build and flesh out over time. But the key thing is actually that I don't want to just showcase how much you should be worth, but also show you and hand you the tools to grow beyond that and to learn to negotiate better, to learn to ask for the, the right amount of money in the right way. There's lots of additional tools and information I want to hand over to you. Everything's free. Check it out, vfxrates.com. Put in your information and you'll instantly get notified of how much money you should be charging per hour as a VFX artist. vfxrates.com. I'm just kind of curious with schoolism, like when did you decide to start that? I mean, is it something that you'd always had, you know, an inkling that you wanted to do? Was it just kind of something you fell into or how did the origin of that happen? Well, when I graduated college, I couldn't get a job. I knew I needed more knowledge. And it was a trip to San Diego Comic-Con where I got to, you know, uh, have dinner with, with one of the artists I really looked up to, uh, still look up to Steven Silver, you know, awesome character designer mm -hmm. and great friend. Um, back then I didn't really know him that well. He invited us to dinner and at dinner I pitched them this idea. I pitched them. I was like, you know, the famous artist course from Norman Rockwell and his, and his compadres, uh, you know, way back where you would buy these textbooks for the famous artist course and these textbooks, textbooks would come in and uh, you do the assignments, you do the lessons, you mail back your assignment, and weeks later, you get a reply, you get another package in the mail, and it is your assignment with some tracing paper on it, and a professional artist has drawn over top of your stuff, not just teaching lessons, but actually doing something specifically towards your art. I said, now we have the internet, Stephen. Now I am going to build a 2000 version of the famous artist course where people, your fans can learn from you directly, specifically. And this was the first of its kind at that time. There's nothing else out there where people were drawing over top of the student's work and sending them a video where they were talking about it. And the, the artist can see them painting and everything on top. Um, you know, I explained this to him and said, you know, we can really change the world. We can really uh, affect a lot of people in a very positive way, especially since schooling is so, so expensive, especially in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and then he totally got it right away. Even though I was just starting my career, you know, he really didn't have much reason to um, believe in me because I didn't really have a reputation at the time. But I feel like... I've seen this many times, not a lot of times, but I do recognize it. When somebody is so driven, even though they have no reputation, no evidence that they will complete what they're saying, you can sense it. You can sense, you could totally feel the people that are, they're going to make it. They got that burning fire. Absolutely. You know, not a tiny, not like, oh yeah, I'm going to be an A student. You know, it's more like I am going to freaking succeed if somebody chops off my arm, my legs and three of my other fingers on the other arm. I will still succeed. I will not slow down. You know, and it's those kind of people that you got to look out for. I feel like that was something that I I had from an early beginning and that's what really helped me. And I still have it now, uh, probably even more, I would say. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, people's passion is contagious. And I think that's the, the number one thing is like, if you if you believe in something, um, and you're that passionate about it, then that is what people get fired up about. That's what people are going to believe in you for is because you have that, you know, the hunger to do something really great. And if you're unsure about something, people see through that, and they start to adopt that mindset, too. It's kind of funny, like yesterday, I'm going to butcher this quote. It's too early in the morning for my brain to be functioning. But I was reading a book which uh, said it. And then later that last night, I was watching a talk and it said something very similar as well, which essentially um, is that, you know, people are 
never, you know, really going to cash in on like what, you know, what you're doing. It's more about what you believe in. And if you don't, um, it's not usually your idea that fails. It's usually your faith in the idea that was never there in the first place. So as long as you have that, you know, that inner burning, uh, that fire, then that's the thing that drives people to, to do great things and to, to see it through at the 11th hour and everything's falling apart. And at the same time, it's what other people, um, you know, really get that reassurance from too, is like knowing that you have that, that fire to do something great and, you know, that you're not going to back down. That's what gets people to, you know, get fired up as well. So I think it's, it's really critical to have that. And I think it's awesome that you, you had that, you know, assurance at the very beginning, you know, that that's something you want to do. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure let that... me let me add to that a little yeah. bit as well, because, you know, um, before what I would say to people is, OK, as long as you are putting in the effort and uh, using your common sense, then you can you can pretty much accomplish most things in art. Um, and then I started thinking about it. And I was like, common sense. A lot of times people's common sense, you know, is not right. Like there was a time where common sense said slavery was cool. That's totally fine. You know, there's a time where uh, common sense said, you know, women shouldn't vote, stuff like that. So now I kind of replace that with as long as you are putting in the effort and using your logic to best ability as possible, because you can put in the most effort in the world and, you know, climb up that ladder as fast and as high as you can. And then you realize it's up against the wrong building, you know, <laughs> and what do you do now? So that's why I'm like, use your logic plus the effort. So you're constantly looking at where you were, looking at where you feel you're headed towards. You count up the out, the, the years, the days or whatever, and think, is that where I want to be in five years? Is that where I want to be in 20 years? Uh, or another really good one to kind of sort out your logic is what, you know, if I was talking to the 50 year old Bobby, you know, what decisions would he want me to make now? Mm -hmm. That's always a really good one because now you're talking about the long term, right? It eliminates um, small term, you know, like short term gains and things like that. It is really about the long game because we want to be artists for the rest of our lives. Nobody is really. I doubt anybody's aiming to be an artist until they're 52 years old and then get laid off. Yep. You know, nobody is trying for that. So always aim for the long game. And the other thing is, is, um, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff, you know, manage a lot of things and work on films. So there can be a lot of pressure. So one thing that I adopted to get rid of pretty much most or all of that pressure is I adopted this belief. Okay. And the belief is, that um, it doesn't matter if your project does well, it doesn't matter if the client likes your work, it doesn't matter about anything except did you put in the time and effort and are you trying to use your logic? You know, if you do those things, then you succeeded. Now, a lot of people might be like, well, shit, you know, I lost that job because I didn't put it in color or whatever it was. <laughs> How is that a success? I said, well, because you're always trying to use your logic. You're always trying to use your logic and you're putting in the effort. So what do you think will happen throughout your career, your whole entire career, of, you know, 30 plus years, 40 years or whatever, if you are always putting in 100% effort and trying to constantly rethink using your logic, am I going in the right direction? You know, if you do those things, all the time, you will have a successful career. You will, even if you have some bumps in the road, even if some things fail, you can't let those kind of things dictate if you succeed or not, because they aren't within your control. Mm -hmm. When you think about, okay, did I put in the effort and the logic? Those are things that we can all do. And that means that we can always kind of succeed if that is your definition of success, which it is for me. I think it's great. I think it's amazing advice. Um, yeah, I, I think that for me, any anything I do, whether it's good or bad, I'm always looking at what I can take away from it. And um, a lot of people around me might think that I'm being negative on myself if like, I do something well and I'm looking at what I could have done better. But for me, it's it's always about that moving forward. And so like looking at that job we lost, you know, for me, that was one of the most valuable lessons I could ever learn. And it is that, okay, you know, uh, as you were mentioning, you know, you, you need to sometimes um, present things in a different light, literally, um, when it comes to 
uh, your work and, or at least kind of share the vision of where it's going. And so there's a lot that I learned just from that one particular event that has helped shape me and the, the work that I've done for, you know, the, the next 15 or so years. So yeah, um, you know, I, I think it's so critical to kind of be able to take that, that knowledge, whether it's good or bad and, and learn from it. Now, um, the other part, if mm-hmm. I may, can I just add something, Alan? Go for it. So uh, the other part to this is that even when you put in the time, the logic, the effort, all that stuff, uh, life will still throw shit patties in your face. And Absolutely. everybody needs to kind of know that as well because you might, you know, get hit in the face when you're totally trying to do your best and your car breaks down and you get a big ticket and, and you need to move and all this stuff just all of a sudden just happens. Things that aren't even related to your job. These things will constantly pop up when you are doing everything right. You're totally on a roll, that's life's test, you mm-hmm. know, and that's the other thing I believe. Anytime that I'm putting in the logic and the effort, I'm going super hard and something horrible happens to me, that is life's test, knocking you down and going, now how do you feel? Now do you still want to keep going? You know, and really all you need to do is kind of look life in the eye and just go, yeah, I'm going to keep going. Put a big smile on your face, stay positive as corny as it sounds that is huge because if you think about it if you get hit by something and you start crying and you're all depressed will that affect your work yeah of course but if you get hit in the face and you smile and you get even more excited because you feel like you're getting closer to that finish line this is getting close to the finish line life is throwing another freaking thing in your face if that gets you even more excited, will that change the overall result than if you were depressed and you know sad and just whimpering at home under the covers? Yes, it would make a huge light, you know, night and day difference. So you got to expect those things. And when they come, you just go, okay, this is what Bobby was talking about. Put a big smile on your face and go, I'm almost there. Life, I am going to pass your test with flying colors because this didn't affect me. And you mm-hmm. keep going. And you might just get hit by another brick in the face. But then that just means you just got to, I just adopt the belief that that means I'm getting even closer. And the thing that is waiting for me, the prize, the the goal is even bigger and better when I reach it. Now, is that true? Mm, You know, not necessarily. But if you think that all the time, if you just adopt this belief, what will happen to your overall results all the time they will generally get better and better unless it's something so big a super huge brick that you know hits us in the face and we die well well, (laughs) it 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 doesn't even really matter at that point because you know you tried your hardest uh, even though life is over or whatever I, I would still be very proud of the fact that I did try my hardest I didn't waste this life you know I did try to do something with it now if that doesn't totally fully move you I'm going to add one other thing to that, because if you're not trying your hardest, if you're not using your logic, life will still throw bricks in your face, but it doesn't mean that good things are going to come. It just means that you, you're not trying your hardest. And if you look at nature shows and things like that, you know, insects getting eaten by other insects that get eaten by lizards that get eaten by, you know, whatever else, life is tough. It is not kind. You know, so if you're not trying your hardest and all that stuff, if you're an animal, you'd get eaten, you know, so that's even more kind of reason to try your hardest, to always use your logic, because no matter what, life will throw a bunch of stuff at your face. (laughs) No, I think it's great. Like, um, you know, I think it's all about the resilience, you know, and the more you're right, like the more that you're able to have those interruptions, those, you know, downfalls, the, the really tough things happen, the more that you're exposed to that and the more that you can just kind of pick it up and keep moving forward rather than, you know, stubbing your toe and, and crying about it. Um, you know, the more all the, the big things that might take other people down, uh, you become resilient to. And it's, it's something that allows you to, you know, adapt and be able to roll with the punches rather than, you know, some of the bigger things that the bigger hurdles coming at you later in life that typically might be showstoppers. Um, you're able to, to avoid or adapt and change and be able to keep moving forward. So I think that, you know, getting exposed to struggle and welcoming it, embracing it rather than, um, you know, seeing everything as, 
uh, an excuse to give up is is how you're going to become a stronger human being, a stronger artist. It's it's going to make you stronger at, at business as well and, and everything you're doing. So I think that's really great advice. And just to, to dive around a little bit, I'll, I'll just got a couple more questions and I'll, I'll let you go. I know you've got a, a busy day ahead of you, but um, I'd love to talk a little bit about, um, you know, just to touch on schools and a bit more, but like, obviously you've got a lot of amazing speakers. I know Craig Mullins, um, I've actually, like, he was one of the people who totally inspired me when I was like 14 years old. Um, so he's really amazing. Uh, Gobi Fields and Nathan have had on the podcast before, really great guys. Um, yeah, I was just kind of curious, like, do you think that for students, and this kind of goes with everything else we're talking about, like, do you think that students uh, tend to need to have that discipline themselves to learn? I mean, I think that a lot of us, it's very easy to kind of say, hey, I'm going to go do this and expect to get force fed all this information. But I think that um, just like anything else, you know, to to really step up and make the most of your career, you're going to need to put in that effort. And I think that it's very easy for people to make excuses um, such as like, I don't have time for this, or, you know, if, if they're failing in, in their learning or not, you know, putting in the effort to, to put the blame on someone else rather than, uh, I guess, pointing out the obvious fact that, you know, you've got to put in the effort yourself if you want to learn and, and be great at what you do. Do you it find is, there's a lot of hesitation with that? It is way more difficult, in my opinion, to, uh, you know, grind and, and develop those skills and everything now because um, there's so many things out there that are looking to entertain you and to waste your time or not necessarily waste your time, but you know what I mean? Like playing video games or whatever. It might be a stress reliever or whatever, but it takes up your time. Um, before when I was a little kid, I didn't have the iPad. I remember being bored, uh, hours on end, days on end. And I would, I would draw, you know, I would kind of have no other choice except to entertain myself. Uh, and now, everybody they could just go to youtube they could go to whatever they could go to twitch they could do a million things um even when they're outside just on their phones or whatever to entertain them but a lot of the best ideas they don't come out of having your mind just full of stimulation they come from an empty mind a mind where you're just sitting there and you're just thinking you're just being uh that's how i came up with schoolism was i was just completely empty mind, just kind of staring off, enjoying the view, looking at the city uh, from from high up and far away, the city of Toronto. And I just saw from far away, I was like, these cities, they kind of look like anthills to me. <laughs> mm-hmm. I remember and I was thinking, well, you know, if I had my own anthill, how, how much more kind of can I do? How much more can I help people and stuff like that? And then that in a weird way, kind of translate it into a website, you know, where artists can converge and learn, and it could just be this hub of, uh, you know, of artists leveling up, you know, and, and learning and sharing and whatever, um, you know. And if I was watching a movie, if I was really stimulated and just watching this awesome movie, I probably wouldn't have thought of that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So, in many ways, um, nowadays it's harder in that aspect and it's easier because everything is so readily available to us it's at our fingertips but everything is so you could play video games or you could watch a lesson and you could spend a whole bunch of hours really working hard and and trying to develop your skills you know what i mean so um i think people that are more and more kind of into meditation into uh practicing their willpower and stuff like that these will be the outliers of the next generation far more, far more than if you were the same in my generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's great. Like, um, yeah, it's, it's so true that I think these days it's people don't even realize it. It's so difficult to do nothing because usually when you're doing nothing, what do you do? You pull out your phone and you know, that's why I think like going for a walk or like for me lately, I've been just making it part of my process. Even if it's just for 10 minutes, just to sit down in in a room and do nothing no computer no devices anything and um i've started to kind of i got a lot of friends who have kids and i've started to adapt that mindset a little bit that the kids you know if they get in trouble they get no device time and i'm like hell yeah like that's actually a good thing that most of us um you know just aren't even uh able to fathom anymore is like you know having moments away from any any feedback or any um you know 
any stimulation at all. And I think that that's it's so critical. Like when I was be, learning digital painting, when I was yeah. learning digital painting, there was no internet. You know, I had to think up my own answers. And that's the other thing that happens when you are just kind of by yourself. You know, you think up new solutions, things that nobody else would have thought up. That's the other problem with, uh, it's all, you know, it's like a double-edged sword again. It's like an advantage and a disadvantage that nowadays, if you have a problem, if you have a question, you can just look it up and you can find an answer. But I'm saying an answer not necessarily the right answer. And what we end up doing is we go, oh, that is the answer. That's what somebody else did to solve this problem. I'm going to do the same thing and I'm going to build on top of it and all of a sudden make an engine uh, that takes the gasoline that was somebody else's you know, answer to energy. And then I'm going to build a car out of that. I'm going to build all this stuff. And we're building off of this wrong answer for mm -hmm. years and years and years or whatever, over time, climbing up the wrong ladder against the wrong building. And then all of a sudden, you know, we just, in the case of cars anyways, we've kind of polluted the world and messed everything up, you know? So when you're always looking on Google for the right answer, the right answer might not even be there. It might be the answer that you find is the answer that everybody goes to, everybody does right now, but it's only because they haven't thought about it themselves and thought up, is this, is this truly the right answer? You know, if you sat there by yourself and kind of just thought, okay, how do I make this car realistic or whatever? You might actually, you have a far better chance of coming up with an answer that nobody else has thought of. I think it's so critical. You're right. Um, yeah. You know, you, you can come up with a better solution and, and that's just it. If you're following everyone else's way, then you're not going to build a better solution, you know, like build a better car or whatever it's going to be. It's going to be literally um, you're adopting, you know, the uh, the concepts other people have done instead of perhaps discovering a, a whole better way of doing things. And, and Alan, like as you grow, you know, it's, as you start your journey through life and all this stuff, don't you notice that so much of the world we're totally doing things wrong totally with so many things right so yeah, yeah uh, if everybody just kind of like just sat there a bit and just really thought things out question um, things a little bit yeah i yeah. feel like the world would be a completely different place so um on that subject like how important do you think it is that people do personal work as well because again it's so easy again to get caught up in uh client work commercial so work. important so yeah. important I schedule that stuff in so much and, you know, it's like I could go home. I could just, you know, just, okay, my day is done. I don't actually need to do this. Um, but that's where so much of the growth comes from. And, of course, those are the things that you can actually put out there and post and stuff. So that really helps just your overall, like, people's awareness of you. Um, but the things, you know, you're talking about personal work. You don't need to do personal work. None of us really need to do personal work. But the personal work, I guarantee it, if you look back in time, maybe all the way to you're a kid again, that personal work is the stuff that opened up new doors for you, new, new opportunities for you. The growth always happens the most in things that you feel, you know, are important. They would be good, but you don't necessarily need to do them. Yeah. Right. Your life is working fine as it is. You don't necessarily need to uh, learn ZBrush or whatever. But if you do those important things that have no urgency, no pressure, those are the doors that will open up opportunities for you that you never would have had before. It's all about also about passion too. You're you're doing something that you actually care about. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it with your the limited spare time that you have. You know, so you get that growth. And you also get to be exploring something that you care about, which um, I think is going to accelerate, you know, how uh, how much it's going to benefit you in the long run, you know, opposed to commercial work where you're you're not your heart isn't going to always be 100 percent in it um, a lot of the time, which, you know, is the flip side. I, and for you, like, you know, obviously you've got a lot on your plate. Like, do you want to paint a small picture in terms of um you know, your personal work, your, you know, all the stuff you're doing for schoolism, your commercial work, um, doing social media, you've obviously got a lot on your plate. Like, how do you typically find the time to, to do it all? Do you tend to um, manage your time really 
carefully or how does that work for you? Yeah, I manage my time uh, very carefully, very disciplined on, on organization and time management. Um, the things that I do, you know, I, I run Schoolism. So there's the online part with like 30 different instructors. And then there's the live part where it's like in different cities around the world. And then there's the lake house and the workshops and the lake house. I have other people that help to run those things and I would work with them to make sure that everything is running properly. So I do have help. Um, but also on top of that, there's also like a, a TV show with Amazon Prime that I co-created with uh, three others um, that, you know, we helped to create it. We sold it to Amazon. Amazon has it now. And, uh, and the other two creators, uh, Adam Jeffcoat, Jim Bryson, they're still on it, you know, to make sure that it runs properly. So a lot of these things I, I do with the exit plan, with knowing how I'm going to get off the treadmill, you know, and, and if you do it right, it can do amazing things. You know, like schoolism has changed so many lives around the world now, now that's been around for over 10 years. Uh, the show Nico and the Sword of Light on Amazon Prime that you could watch right now on primevideo.com. <laughs> it was the first show to win an Emmy for best, you know, children's animated uh, TV show 2016 from just the pilot episode, you know, and and. Then there's the movie stuff that I get to work on, which is super fun and super rewarding. Um, and then there's my personal work. You know, I'm, I'm creating, I'm toying with the idea of creating a new art book because it's been a while. So I've been doing a lot of these unusual looking unicorns on my Instagram. Uh, I also have this show called The Jim Bob Drawing Show, which I do with uh, Jim Bryson, one of the co-creators of Nico and Soy Light. That's just for fun. I mean, we just... You know, we draw stuff together and we talk about it and it's just a fun show. And then I interview, you know, I interview just like you, Alan, I interview all these artists um, on a regular pretty much at least once a week. You know, I do that and I, I meditate for like an hour every day. Uh, an hour? An Holy shit. Yeah. Meditation is a huge part of the, the regimen, you know, um, and there's some other stuff that I probably do too. So it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, how do I manage all this stuff? Uh, no, no. How the fuck do you manage all this stuff? <laughs> yeah, like that's impressive. Like, um, yeah. Do you do you have a process or a way that you typically, um, you know, look at all the tasks you got to do every day or every week, or how do you manage it? I I pretty much I have two things. One's a to do list. One is the calendar. So the calendar will tell me what is immediate. And what is off far in the distance. So what do I need to do at three o'clock? What do I need to do at four o'clock? Everything is scheduled in time blocks. Um, and I schedule those things the day before. So the day that I come in, like today, I have my whole entire schedule for today already done. Great. And, and the schedule is open to all the other uh, people that work at Imaginism Studios. There's like 14 of us full time in Toronto. And they can all add in their own appointments with me anywhere on my calendar, but I'm always organizing. I've over, I've, I've already organized tomorrow's schedule today all the time. So if they want whatever appointment with me, they don't have to ask me, they could just put it in, but they would have to most likely put it in for the next day or the day after or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. that way I can come in, I could just do whatever's on my schedule, not even think about anything else and just go bam, 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 get through it all with no disruptions, Love it. right? And, and that way, everybody else, they can see all these things I got to do too, which in, in a great way, I feel makes them more motivated to get a bunch of stuff done as well, mm -hmm. you know, especially if they're asking me for help. If I'm doing seven things and you're doing three and you ask for me for help, are you going to make sure that those three things get done very, very well? Yeah, probably. Because you're probably feeling bad that you're asking me for help with all the stuff I got to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's um, great. Yeah. And the last thing I do is uh, I have a theme for every year. You know, I, I would think up a theme. So last year it was uh, work on schoolism online. That was the, the main focus. So that's why I've been doing for the last year. And uh, next year it's all about schoolism offline. 
So I'm going to be traveling a lot more. It's going to be great. I miss traveling, you know, so I don't try to schedule everything in. So everything is moving at the same time. I'm more like I have groups of things that I'll concentrate on, you know, and, and try to have the other things be managed by other people or just not right now. I love that. And um, there's so many things that you've mentioned um, in the past hour that, yeah, just very similar to either experiences I've had, like saying no has definitely become uh, a massive part of my life. And and <laughs> that's one thing I've talked about a lot in the podcast was theming my years and specifically um, 2015 was my year of just saying no to everything as an experiment. And um, that by far changed my life more than probably any other year, just because it allowed me to free up time to say yes to the right projects. And I've got such a notorious um, history of saying yes to something and then missing out on such a bigger opportunity right around the corner. And by saying no to anything, unless it really screamed out as being something I really want to do. Um, you know, I tripled my revenue. Uh, I managed to do the projects I cared about. All the things I've been putting off for years, I suddenly had time to do. And you think that you're, you're, limiting yourself by doing that but if anything is allowing me to actually do the things i wanted rather than being, being too busy to do the things i really cared about um i'm curious like do you when you said you kind of theme your years like how far into the future have you got so far i mean do you really have a a, a very regimented idea of the next five years or is i have more... ideas yeah i have yeah. ideas but if it's further than a year the further it is out, things are going to change then, then the more adjustable it becomes like this is the idea that i have for 2019 which i already have um will it actually happen i don't know you know i'm just going to keep moving forward and seeing if it's logical and just going to keep putting in the effort and keep thinking is this logical to keep going down this direction you know there there's all these people all these people that tell you you just gotta put in so much effort never give up never give up but what if you are doing the wrong thing mm -hmm. what if you're actually you know making the wrong decision and you're putting in all this effort into it that's where i keep coming back to bring back in the logic you know keep questioning everything that you're doing is this the right direction should i be doing this because yeah. if you just put in all the effort in the world, you know, and rubbing two iron rods together, you will never make fire. Well, it's like boiling water, you know, it's like it, there's only a set temperature it needs to be to um, to boil. And beyond that, you're just wasting energy, you know. And I like to think of that as, you know, there's so many things that we're doing that we could be wasting so much time, like, um, you know, whereas you can get that the minimum effective dose to uh you know, to get the the desired result that you want. And I think that's really critical is, you know, you've got a set amount of time in every single day. Where do you want to allocate all that time? And if you wanted to put it all into your work and not focus on your personal life or even just you time or resting and all the other things that indirectly will uh, bring back value to your work and make it better. And of course, long term, make your life better, then you're just going to end up burning out uh, and having only put all your energy into that one thing. One little thing about that as well is uh, a lot of times fear and logic are very close in feeling, okay? When you feel like it's illog you know, it's not logical anymore to do that, a lot of times that's fear in disguise. Mm -hmm. So you got to really think about it. Is this really logical? That's why I'm saying is my decision logical? That's why I'm walking away. Or is it because of fear? If it's because of fear, I'm telling you, keep moving forward. If you want to do something with your life, keep moving forward. If it's logic saying, yeah, this is not the right direction, then you stop. There's a big thing about fear of failure because I, I feel like a lot of people have fear of failure. So therefore, they don't try in the first place, you know, because, you know, if I try this, I can fail. And at the same time, though, like something that a lot of people don't realize is that they can also have fear of success. And I've got so many people in my life that I know that are so amazing, so talented, way more talented than I could ever dream to be. Yet they don't want to do whatever their big dreams are. Like one of my friends is an amazing uh, director, but he doesn't want to make that his, his ultimate career just because I think he's afraid of succeeding. And uh, along the way, you know, it's it's one of those things that um, you know, you, you need to identify like why, when you do get that resistance, like why am I feeling that resistance? Is it something logical or is it something illogical? And a lot of times, like if you think of like what could be the worst thing that could happen, it's like, well, I could fail and 
you know, people might laugh at me. Okay, is that the worst thing in the world? No, it's not that bad. And it's probably not going to happen anyway. And if it does, then what can I do to prevent that from happening? Putting in safety guards. And that way you can't fail. And therefore, like, it's illog illogical, it's irrational to have that fear anymore because you've removed any opportunity for that to really happen or it isn't even that bad an um, outcome. So, you know, I think that the biggest thing that holds most people back is themselves because everyone has that unlimited potential, but it's more about whether or not you um, you allow yourself to, to, to do the things you want to do and, and, you know, make those big changes. Agreed. <laughs> Do you have any advice for people on how to stand out, whether it's, you know, social media or, um, you know, just things that they can do to kind of get their name out there or to, you know, essentially stand out from all the other amazing, talented artists who are on ArtStation and all these other locations? Uh, yeah, you know, um, well, number one, the long, the long term plan that I would advise people is you're always learning, you know, don't let the job get it in the way of constantly learning. And I know so many people that will say, but I learn on the job. Yeah, I learn on my job too. You know, but there is no better fast forward than if you, if you take a lesson, if you read a good book and they are distilling things that, that they have learned over 10 or 20 or 30 years into a little book that you can, you know, go through in in a few days or really go through it over and over again in a few months right and that's the ultimate fast forward if you are constantly learning and you get to a point where you're successful and you're still constantly learning how many people out there actually do that how many people actually go to as many workshops as i do mm -hmm. as take as many online classes as i do even though I, i'm already you know, um, I'm not looking for more jobs and things like that. I'm not struggling anymore. Um, I'm still doing that. I really feel like if you do do that, that is the ultimate protection. That is the ultimate force field for unemployment, you know, against yeah. unemployment, against being um, irrelevant. You know, because a lot of times when you're doing these lessons and everything as well, you're creating your own personal art. You're expanding your your set of knowledge, uh, your tool set, and all this stuff, you're able to actually post it. You're able to share with the world. It, you're not working on confidential stuff, you know, mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and I'm saying this because now that's been like 20 years since I've been a professional artist, a little bit over, uh, I've seen great people have awesome careers for 10 years and then become irrelevant. You know, 10 years is a long time. And when you're early, when you're in your early 20s, it's hard to even fathom that amount of time because 10 years ago, you're a tiny little kid that didn't even go through puberty yet. You know, so when you get older, as you get into your 30s and stuff, 40s, then time, you start to understand the power of it. No, uh, it's so critical. Right? Yeah. And yeah, I think that um, I, I'm going to loop back to what you're saying, but um, yeah, I, I think it's such a, a relevant thing that we're, we're having discussion, me and my team last week about this, that, you know, a lot of people, I feel they, they do enough to get into the industry and then they think, okay, cool. I've arrived. I can now yeah. stop learning. And, um, I think, you know, you initially said it right, actually. I think that by not learning and by not in, continuing to improve yourself, it's actually a sure way, surefire way of guaranteeing you will be unemployed because, um, you know, it's the worst thing in the world is to, to get to that point where you are 20 years in and, and having to switch careers. And it shocks me. Some of the people who I know, like who I grew up with, who are amazing artists and then now they're doing something completely different because they needed consistent work. And I've always been baffled by that. Like, why are you struggling to find work? Like you're, you're so-and-so you're, you're amazing. And uh, I was just reading this the other day in uh, this uh, Chet Holmes book uh, about, you know, I think it's, 10% of the planet typically really yearn to, to learn more and that really want that growth. And the other 90% don't have that. They kind of get to the point of they, they find their job and then they're like, okay, great. The study's over and now I can just, you know, go be a cog in the works and, and do my thing. Is, and that's that sounds why, familiar. Is that um, the ultimate sales machine? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. And um, it's just, it's just kind of funny because I, I read that book a long time ago and I just randomly opened it up to that page the other day and, um, you know, completely nothing related to, to our field. But I, I thought it was really fascinating that, um, you know, it mentioned it because it was exactly what we'd been talking about. And, and that is exactly why a lot of places have those 
seminars and recertifications and all these things in place so that way you're kind of forced in your job to continue to learn and to get up to speed with what the latest and greatest things are because the thing is that there is so much information out there and it is very discouraging to go on YouTube and as you mentioned earlier there could be all these different things um, people are showing and sharing but they could be the wrong things for a start and on top of that you get paralysis by analysis there's so much information you don't know who to trust or where to go and um in at the same time, like you you want that narrow vision, and that's why I think it's important to to latch on to school uh, to to um to you know online schools or to specific courses where you have a, a a set curriculum and you're not you know being torn in fifty directions as all these things pop up on your screen on YouTube. And um, yeah, I, I think it's yeah. Just... Look at what what kind of art do those people do that you want to mm -hmm. learn from, and when did they do that art? 10, 15 years ago or two months ago? Yeah. You know, I, I know of this teacher where I saw a drawing on his desk and I was like, oh, wow, that's a nice drawing. And he was like, oh, that old thing? I was like, what, when did you do that? And he was like, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I go, oh, where's your new stuff? And he's like, I don't have any. I don't have any new stuff. I've just been teaching. I was like, then you're probably, I'm just thinking in my head, you're probably teaching the wrong thing. Yeah. You know, and that's being kind. You are teaching the wrong thing because you as the teacher, you're trying to teach people how to become successful artists. It's much easier for a person to learn how to become a successful artist from a successful artist, right? And that mm -hmm. is so like a teacher, they should be the rock stars of the world, not celebrities or whatever. They should be the teachers and the scientists and whatever, the people that are at such high levels that they have something totally invaluable to give back. You know, if they were considered the rock stars of the world, the greatest teachers in the world were, were considered the greatest rock stars of the world, then everybody would try to, to teach at some point. And it, they wouldn't be teaching to just give back. They would be teaching because that is the ultimate prestige. That is the ultimate goal. And, Absolutely. you know, if it was a perfect world, that's exactly how it would be. And that's that is one of the, the driving forces also behind schoolism, because a lot of these guys, you know, you're on the grind, right? You're all you hear every day are revisions. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't get the appreciation from the fans as much because you aren't traveling the world. You, you aren't meeting all these people in like Dubai that you've affected or Egypt that you've affected. Uh, you don't feel it, you know, and, and that if you did feel it, you would put much more importance on giving back. And actually today I put out this book on YouTube. It's free for everybody. You just got to search the perfect bait and uh, you'll find it on YouTube. It's a book that I wrote 2011. I put it out. It's sold out for a bunch of years. So I just decided Cyber Monday, which is today, <laughs> uh, to put it out there, you know, on such a sale that it's actually free. I don't want anything from you guys. I just want people to do better with their lives and achieve their dreams. You know, I just want to I just want to see this book affect people in a positive way like how it's affected me. Now, the book has some things in it that are, you know, a bit dated like uh, I say Dice Tatsumi is an art director at Pixar. He's no longer art director at Pixar. He owns his own studio, Tonko House, and he was nominated for an Oscar. Things like this where it was in 2011 or I, sure. I say you stream and live stream instead of Twitch, you know, things like that. But all the principles involved, those are principles that I absolutely adhere to that has gotten me to where I am now. And since the book, I've been able to meet so many more of my absolute artistic heroes. I've been able to work on so many more awesome projects. I've been able to travel the world so much more. And I won an Emmy. And I'm not saying this to, you know, big up myself. I just want people to know that it you, works. You want to leave works. the impression that, yeah, like it's it's proven, it's tested. Yes. So I, I encourage everybody to just, you know, look it up and listen to it because that's the only thing I'm trying to do here is just trying to, you know, affect people's lives in a positive way. And if you like the book, you know, share it with others because if you help somebody else, then you will get some good karma from that as well. Um, 
And the last thing before I forget, if you don't mind, um, mm -hmm. yeah. you, know, you were talking about how do people stand out, right? How do you get noticed from the very beginning? And I gave a very kind of, it could be looked at as like a convoluted answer of like the long game, which a lot of people will not relate to as much. So I want to give people some very actionable things that they can do to get noticed right now, today, mm -hmm. right? And so the first thing is art station currently, that's the thing. That's the thing that you want to be on, uh, especially for, you know, live action films, um, games that are more kind of realistic, I would say, and some animated stuff as well. I've you know known some people that look on ArtStation for animated kind of style artists. Um, when you post something, take the time to cruise through ArtStation and comment on other people's stuff in a, in a very genuine way not like a cut and paste awesome kind of comment, uh, yeah. but actually look at their stuff and talk about it and try to look at a lot of people that are at pretty much your same skill level, your same popularity and all that stuff, maybe a tiny bit higher because those are the people that are most, most likely to respond, mm -hmm. right? And every time you post something up, if you spend like 25 minutes, 30 minutes, you know, conversing with other people, commenting on their stuff in a genuine way, what do you think is going to happen if you have a hundred followers, that person has a hundred followers, you comment on their stuff, they're going to look at your stuff and very likely they'll probably comment on it as well. You know, then there's things like, um, you know, using your logic. It's so Instagram, for example, the whole name Instagram, it, it means instant. It's an instant gram, right? So the more instant it feels, the more traction it will get. So if I'm actually drawing, I'll just take a picture of myself still drawing. It's not done yet. It's not in presenting kind of mode yet. I'll just take a picture, my hands in the picture, I'm drawing with a pencil. Those kind of images, those kind of posts, they get more traction than the totally finished image and whatever that I might post. Or the same sketch. If I posted one sketch with my hand in it, I'm still drawing, it's in the middle of drawing, and the other one, it doesn't have the hand. Same sketch, the one with the hand will get more traction. Absolutely. People want that insight, like they want access to you and, and behind the scenes, you know, and it's very yeah. easy to see the finished polished thing, but to actually get to see the the process, I think uh, for a lot of people, it, it's so critical. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, it's, it's totally like logical things that anybody can do. Uh, you know, I found on Facebook, if I post a uh, purple unicorn and then I post a orange unicorn, which one's going to get more traction? The orange unicorn. Why? Because Facebook is predominantly what color? It's blue. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't mean, okay, shit, I, you know, I want to post something on Facebook. It has to be orange or whatever. But to know these things will help you. I well, I, I could be a dick and, um, and talk about Facebook's algorithm and how it's actually going to um, share different colors more than others as well. So, because you're absolutely right. You got the, uh, uh, on, on one side, you got, uh, you know what people respond to and then at the same time these days it's insane how you you know for you to get your voice heard you've also got to work within the bounds of um those platforms too so you're right like um sure learn about the algorithms as well you know those yeah. are things that i'm very interested in in as well that's why on my fan page now if i post a video i'm going to upload the video to facebook instead of youtube and give you a link that takes you off of facebook because the mm -hmm. algorithm, it won't be as kind to that post than if I put it, actually uploaded the video to Facebook. Mm -hmm. Wait, so you're saying that you would upload it directly to Facebook or would you link yeah, it I to would. YouTube? Yeah, I would. If I'm yeah. sharing it on Facebook, I would upload the video to Facebook. I wouldn't put a link directing people away from Facebook onto you know, YouTube. Exactly. Yeah, it's so critical. And there's a lot of big no-nos that people... Um, don't think of and you're right like for for instance facebook they want you to stay on facebook and at the same time um you know having video on there is something they encourage because they want that to become a recognized video platform and um you know it's the same thing doing facebook live you know that's something that obviously right now if you're doing twitch and everything else um it's great but like doing specifically facebook live people are always going well facebook's going to encourage you and share your notification more with people because they want to reward people for you know adopting that as a, a live streaming platform so yeah i mean the more you kind of get into it the more you can kind of realize like hey what are the rules i need to do if i'm going to paste the link into facebook remove it after it creates the you know the thumbnail image because it doesn't want you to to 
paste the link when it's already formatted and made it look all nice. You know, all the little things are going to help you get your stuff out there. And like I've seen the difference between someone getting, you know, a thousand likes in their image and one person getting two likes. And it's, you know, it's typical, um, typically just little hacks or little things that they're doing wrong that are in the long run affecting it from getting shared or getting, you know, seen in the first place. And you obviously want that. You want to use this as a big stage to be able to showcase your work and, and get noticed opposed to, you know, um, fall by, you know, fall into the noise of all the other amazing talent that's kind of up and coming. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention, because like we're starting off, right? This, the scenario is you're just starting off as an unknown artist and maybe you have some skills. Hopefully you got a bunch of skills. Uh, you just want to get noticed. Um, the other part of this is what do you do when it's live, when you're at an event and you want to network? Cause that's why most of us go to events. Mm -hmm. So the tip that I have for people in those kind of situations is number one, get there early, get there totally on time or slightly early. If you invite me to a party and I'm going to come, I generally get there like five minutes early or smack dead right on time. Why? Because it's, it's a habit that I've had since I started because, you know, say, uh, Ian McKegg. I don't know Ian McKegg at this time and he's at this party. Okay. If he came on time and I came on time, who else is at this party? Are all of his friends at this party yet? Probably not. What are, what's the best chance that you will get to talk with Ian McKegg in a genuine conversation and for him to remember you? It's if nobody else is in the room, mm -hmm. right? Great. So for example, at San Diego Comic-Con, I went to um, this Disney uh, party that they had and I got there right on time. I asked a bunch of people outside, who's inside? They said, no, nobody. There's only like three people inside. I said, great, I'll see you guys inside. And I went inside, right? And, and there were only three people. One of them was head of story on Frozen 2, you know, and I didn't know him, but now I do. You know, I got to talk with them a bunch and will he remember me? Ho well, hopefully, you know, but that was the best chance to actually talk with him and get to know him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's awesome. Uh, you're absolutely right. Like you're removing all the noise from all the other people um, and getting that FaceTime, you know, so um, avoiding the norm and doing not what everyone else is doing, but, um, you know, it's going to create more opportunities for yourself. That's great. Do you have any other networking tips? Yeah, I got a bunch. Um, the other one is where do I go and talk with people? Uh, Generally, I'll choose one of two things. I'll either look at where it's happening the most in the room and I'll stand right in the center, put a big smile on my face, you know, be happy because you're, you could be in a worse place right now and just be happy and look for the, if I don't know anybody, this is like, if you're a total newbie, be happy, look around and look for the most bored person there and go and talk to them as a warm up. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have trouble talking with strangers, because that person will most likely be very thankful that he or she has somebody to talk to. Or yeah. a really good one is you look for the non-artist whose spouse is an amazing artist and you go and you talk with that person. Don't talk to the professional. Let the spouse introduce you, you know, because um, there's so many times where, you know, at, at these kind of events where a lot of people might want to talk with me, things like that. Uh, but if Kay, if Kay Asadera, my lovely, talented wife, uh, comes over and says, you got to meet Brian, no matter how busy I am, I'll go, okay, sure. You know, and that person, of course, Kay, she also has her fans and all this stuff. So it might not be the same situation. But if it's, say, like a spouse, a girlfriend, boyfriend, wife or husband that isn't in art, but their spouse is, um, they will be very glad to talk with you because everybody wants to talk with their spouse. Right. And and if you are interesting or whatever, a lot of times they will volunteer to you know introduce you. I love it. Yeah, no, that's really great advice. And you're right, it's kind of entering through the side door by, um, by, you know, rather than lining up with a thousand other people to speak to that person, you you essentially got someone on the inside who's able to... It's like to, going um, to the club through the kitchen. You know, it's <laughs> awesome. Yep. No, it's great. It's really cool, man. Um, yeah, this has been really awesome. And I'll definitely link to the, uh, the perfect link. Uh, sorry, perfect bait. Um, I'll definitely link to that uh, um, in the show notes as well. So um, for anyone who wants to find out more about you, where can they go? 
Uh, they could go to schoolism.com and see me at a live event, or you know, you can uh, follow me right now. The the main thing that I use is Instagram, and uh, you could just search up my name, Bobby Chu, C H I U, or my actual handle is Digital Bobbert, which is I don't know why I chose that. <laughs> but, uh... We don't think about this stuff when we start, you know, building out our um, our handles, do we? No, <laughs> no, we don't. I interviewed um, one of the, he's now a director uh, working for Guillermo del Toro, but he's one of the original guys at Pixar. And uh, I remember at the time uh, we're doing a podcast episode and I was like, oh, by the way, like what's what's your handle on, on Skype? And he's just like, <sighs> Captain Schmitty. And I was just like, okay, I won't ask to stream the time, but you know, everyone, everyone's got their little thing. Oh, so if you look up Captain Schmitty, you could talk with a famous director. There you go. I, I, I just hesitate as you. I'm like, ah, should I? Yeah, it's pretty funny. We've, we've all got those. Um, cool. No, I'll definitely link to all this in the show notes, but this has been really awesome, man. It's been a pleasure, Alan. Thank you cool. very much. Again, I want to thank Bobby for taking the time out to chat. This is a lot of fun to get a lot of insights from Bobby as well as share his story. Now, as a heads up, uh, I've got a lot of really great episodes coming up. Um... Terrell Whitlatch, which was one of the artists who created Jar Jar Binks, as well as a lot of other really memorable characters, but Jar Jar, come on. Uh, that's going to be really fun. I think that it's kind of been fun being able to interview artists who were responsible for Gollum and all these other very memorable CGI characters that had a lot of impact on the visual effects industry. So talking to Terrell and a few other really great artists, there's a lot of really cool interview episodes coming up as well um next episode is going to be with kevin bailey from atomic fiction talking about how he got started and running an extremely successful visual effects facility as well as being an innovator with a lot of the software that they're developing turning to the cloud as a solution for running entire visual effects studios as well as how he got started, which again, he's someone who literally straight out of school went to uh, go for George Lucas, which I thought was hilarious because he's not the first person on this podcast to right out of school end up in George's office. So talking about hitting the ground running and how he managed to go from high school to literally lining up a job working next to Doug Chang and George Lucas and all these other amazing artists and everything along the way, I will say that Kevin is one of those people that I've always been excited to work with and I can never have seen enough nice things about him. He's definitely someone that I've just seen as being such an innovator in his industry. And yeah, so I'm really excited for this episode. Uh, it was interesting filming, filming it, recording it because um, I just flown to LA, went through traffic, got to my hotel in West Hollywood, ran in the door and literally had to figure out how the hell I'm going to record it since my laptop wasn't set up to uh, to record. So there's a lot of panicking from the minute I walked in the door. But um, yeah, this episode turned out great and it was a lot of fun. Now, a couple of things are going to be happening is I'm going through a bit of a rebranding stage with the podcast. And this has been a long time coming and it should have been something that happened a long time ago as well. But the future and how I'm going to shift things around a little bit is that I want to kind of go back to the roots of the podcast a little bit, a lot more solo episodes. I love doing the interviews and I definitely will continue them. However, I have noticed a lot. I mean, I get a lot of feedback, which is always around the solo episodes I put out. And at the same time, like I want these to be as personable as possible. Um, I do also want to tie this into YouTube more as well. So a lot of the content that I put out here, I'm also going to probably film as I do it. So that way it will go out on YouTube as well. And I also want to rebrand this a little bit just to kind of make sure that the message is very clear that this isn't just a podcast for visual effects. This is something that I designed always to be for creatives in our industry. And more importantly, those of us who either are looking to just get into the industry or switch uh, around, like switch careers, or a lot of us who've been in the industry for quite a long time, which is very general to say all of that, but what I'm getting at is for all of us who are looking to take our career to the next level. So in other words, I think that a lot of us, we have this this dream that we want to do X, Y, Z, but there's only a few of us to really qualify ourselves, give ourselves permission to really say, okay, well, look, I want to do all these things. How do I do it? Maybe I need some help. Maybe I just need to have a bit of inspiration. Maybe I need someone to kick my ass. Maybe I'm lost. Whatever it is, we need to qualify ourselves by listening to this podcast, by going to YouTube, by going to my website, whatever it might be, 
to raise our hand and say, it's time for me to cut the bullshit and really step up and apply myself. Put in the time, put in the effort, get out of my comfort zone, do all the things that are necessary for me to get the results that I want. And that's what this podcast is about. This, that's what this podcast is more focused on. Definitely from episode one, it's never been the happy, fluffy, let me give you a hug and tell you everything's going to be okay kind of podcast. But at the same time, I've been very careful to not spread the propaganda that the industry is failing and all these things that a lot of the snake oil salesmen uh, that are out there who are doing a lot of this kind of publicity around the negativity of the, of the industry or let's say going around giving talks at all the events about how bad the industry is and you know come to me I have the solution or whatever it might be because there is so much of that around and none of it's real none of it's physical none of that is actually the case I mean there's so much work there's more work now than there's ever been ever and the best part is it's accessible by the entire world you don't need to be in the LA or New York bubble to get work 10 years ago, there were pretty much three cities in the world you could work in film in, and then, you know, tiny little pockets here and there. And usually that was incentive driven. So the industry keeps changing and evolving, but it's all for the better. And I'm really excited for that. But more importantly, I want the message to be very clear about who this is for. And that is for everyone who is looking to really step up their goals, their careers, really get to where they want to be. Because I think it's so easy for us to kind of get in the rut or have that inner doubt that, you know, I want to do this, but who am I kidding? Or having the people around me telling you that you aren't going to be able to ever achieve that thing that you want to set out and do. It's a lot easier, easy for us. And by the way, I'm, I'm eating my words here because I don't want to edit this out. I want to just kind of say what I want to say. But I think it is very easy for us to conform and to say, okay, well, look, everyone else is doing this. So I better just roll with the punches and do what everyone else is doing. When a smart person is able to look at what everyone else is doing and say, how can I do this better? And that's something that I've always looked at with my career is not necessarily listening to authority and saying, okay, well, this is what apparently is the best direction to go, but instead to listen to my gut and occasionally eat shit, making the wrong mistakes and everything else as well, but allow me to innovate and move forward. And I think that that is the critical part for a lot of us, especially in a very oversaturated industry. There is so much work around, but there's also a lot of pitfalls or ways that we can kind of get stuck in jobs and careers that pay our bills, but maybe don't give us the fulfillment that we want. And ultimately, I think what's really critical is to be able to realize, hey, there are ways to skip ahead and, and ways that we can get around everything. With the internet, with um, the world being so tiny as it is right now, it's ridiculous how easy it is for us to make a short film and get it in front of a million people or to get our artwork in front of the right people to get our own exhibit or get the traction that we need. And I think a lot of us and, and the way a lot of industries still work is still the 1980s way of this is how it's always been. Start in the mail room and work your way up. And that isn't the case now. For those of us willing to innovate and to take the risks, we literally can do whatever we want. And I love that. And I, I think that not enough of us realize that as well. So I think this is a, a really critical time for all of us and, and something that we should really take to heart and make the most of. So that being said, um, a lot of good changes, big changes coming up. I'm really excited for this. But as I mentioned, a lot more solo episodes as well. And uh, like I said, there's going to be a bit of rebranding. So you might hear a new introduction to the podcast, which is a little bit more in tune with what I would want. I think in the very beginning, you know, there are certain podcasts I listened to and definitely kind of made the, the jingle at the beginning kind of cater more towards that. And actually, I've got an interview coming up with one of the compositor leads at Weta. And we talk about Paul Walker in the Fast and Furious and the, all the CGI work they did, which is so seamless. It's amazing. Um, and funnily enough, Cameron, who who's uh, in one of the upcoming episodes at Weta, he was asking whether it was me at the, uh, the beginning of the podcast introducing myself. And just to clarify that, no, it isn't me. Um, but I thought it was kind of funny that Cameron Son I've known for a very, very long time. So for him to kind of mistake my voice, I thought it was kind of funny. Um, all right. So yeah, there's loads of cool stuff coming up though. And that's what I kind of wanted to mention is that right now I kind of feel like the website, the podcast, all of these things are aligning. It's a perfect time, especially with a lot of the things I've been working on behind the scenes to kind of mention to keep an eye out, I guess, for all the, the good things coming up. Um, I'll leave it there. And like I said, I've been kind of eating my words a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of throw this out there. And yeah, so if you want 
check out my website, alanmckay.com. If you want to check out the show notes for this episode, which includes a lot of key takeaways, quotes, and other stuff like that, go to alanmckay.com slash 147 for episode 147. And that is it for now. I'll be back next episode with Kevin Bailey, one of the founders of Atomic Fiction. And beyond that, like I said, lots of solo episodes and other great episodes coming up. Until then, rock on. Rock on.